Well, it's kind of a long history here. Uh, I, I, uh, let's start with my early childhood. You know, as a toddler, the God I learned to believe in, or was taught to believe in, at my mother's knee. Um, this was a fairly large family, not a huge family, six children. And um, uh, I was the second born in, uh, in a family of six children. And by the way, my wife was the second born in a family of six children. I don't know what that means, <laughs> but that's just kind of an interesting thing that we have noticed. But my mother uh, was uh, converted to Christianity in her college days. So she didn't grow up as a child in the church. And she had a remarkable way of dealing with children. She was uh, uh, in middle age, I think, when she went back to school at Portland State and um, graduated the same year that my sister graduated from Portland State, my older sister. Uh, but then she went into teaching. And her remarkable ability to get through to children uh, led to a situation where any problem child in the other sections of the same grade would be put in her class, where there would be no problem at all. She simply had a, an interesting way of letting children feel as if she's on their side. Uh, but anyway, it was just unthinkable in my family that our parents would love some of us or care about some of us more than uh, they cared about other, uh, the other siblings. Uh, so um, that in itself, because she taught me as a young child to believe strongly in the love of God, that God wills the best for every one of his creatures that he brings into existence. Uh, I was I was drawn to texts like First uh, First Timothy two four, you know, God sincerely desires or wills the salvation of all humans, literally all men, and Second uh, Peter uh, three nine I think it is, um, where he says God is not willing that anyone should perish. So that was one influence in my early childhood, was the loving family, the God that I learned to believe in, sort of at my mother's knee. But the other influence was my father was raised in a very conservative fundamentalist church. And uh, although he did, uh, didn't reflect some of the judgmental and self-righteous uh, aspects of that, uh, we were raised in a, I was raised in a fundamentalist church. Uh, and I went to a, f a very conservative fundamentalist high school where a good Christian was uh, regarded as someone who doesn't smoke, drink, dance, roller skating was iffy, play cards, or attend Hollywood movies. In fact, there's some interesting anecdotes I could give you from my childhood. Uh, like uh, all of my aunts and uncles and cousins were from the same background as my father was, uh, not surprisingly. And uh, once when uh, I was traveling to Seattle from uh, uh, Portland to visit my uh, cousins, uh, I was with my uncle and there was somebody else that was driving and they were having a conversation about a third person. They were talking about the third person and witnessing to this third person. And the driver, who wasn't my uncle, my uncle, I was in the back seat. Uh, the driver asked uh, my uncle, does he know you're a Christian? To which my uncle ad <laughs> answered, he knows I don't smoke. <laughs> And um, in high school, you know, I had come to believe that all the people around me believed that uh, going to Hollywood movies was a terrible sin. 
So my very freshman year in high school, I went to, uh, my folks didn't mind me going to films. And I remember I went to a couple of Westerns with a friend of mine from the public school, downtown Portland. I even remember one of them was starring Burt Lancaster. I think it was the film called Apache. But anyway, we went to the, saw, it was a double feature. I don't even remember what the other uh, movie was. We come out and we walk a block or two and I run into one of my classmates. And this was, by, this was within the first month of my uh, uh, attending uh, this high school. Uh, and uh, he says, Tom, how are you doing? What are you doing? He says, and of course I was so embarrassed. I can't believe this. I was so embarrassed. Oh, we were over here. Of course my friend who had no, nothing to hide said, oh, we took in a couple of Westerns. <laughs> And that crushed me. I was so embarrassed, I couldn't sleep that night. Unbelievable. But the interesting thing is that this guy went to movies all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and in fact, uh, the way we expressed our rebellion, he, he was, uh, was in the group that I was close to and we, we expressed our rebellion by letting it be known that we went to the movies sometimes. <laughs> Real serious rebellion. But anyway, um, this tradition believes strongly in an eternal hell. We were, it was just part of the teaching that I, I learned in Sunday school, in church, and in high school. Um, and I didn't really question it then. I'm not sure I had any clear idea how to reconcile that with the other things that I believed about God. And it was later in my, as an undergraduate that uh, I kind of felt some tensions here in, in, in college. And I resolved them in my own mind sort of the way C.S. Lewis resolved those, resolves those tensions. The point is that uh, I gravitated towards a free will theodicy of hell, sort of an Arminian view. But as an undergraduate, I also uh, encountered for the first time a serious Calvinist. In fact, it's the pastor of the church of the woman I ended up marrying. <laughs> and I still remember you know, I had gone through high school and grade school and Sunday school and all this, but and I I had heard of Calvinism, but it was more as if the Calvinists believed in eternal security. That was the big thing. But when I discovered that people actually believed that there were people that God had foreordained from the beginning of time would be lost forever. I could not believe that. In fact, the first time I met the uh, uh, pastor of uh, my wife's church is he came to Portland State to give a talk to the YFC group. Is that what they call it? Youth for Christ, yeah. Yeah. And I couldn't believe that anybody believed this. I mean, it, it, was, it was as if my parents willed some of their, willed that some of their children would be happy and flourishing and, well, redeemed forever, and others would be lost forever. How could a, a God of the sort that I learned to believe in at my mother's knee, how could that sort of God believe what the Calvinists, I mean, do what the Calvinists say that, that he did? That he picked a limited elect and he foreordained that they would be redeemed forever and he left behind others. I mean, doesn't it immediately follow that he doesn't love all of them equally and maximally? It seems to. And so... Uh, that's when I uh, kind of realized 
that um, there's this one claim that the Calvinists make and claim that, and they think it's a, 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 an unavoidable uh, teaching of Scripture and a claim that the Arminians make, which they think is an unavoidable teaching of Scripture. If you put those two claims together, universal salvation seems to be an inevitable consequence. And that's when I started uh, uh, realizing that the Bible is not that easy to interpret. I mean, if you have people who claim that the Bible is an inerrant word of God, and they, they hold inconsistent views about what is taught there, what are you going to conclude from that? Well, what I concluded was that the Bible is a collection of 66 books, if you leave the Catholic books out, um, and you have a variety of different kind of emphases, and it's not a systematic theology. Um, and in fact, you can formulate a, a set of three propositions, which is what I started to do in my own mind, um, where one of them has to be false. And yet each one of them, you can find a tradition, a Christian tradition that affirms it as a clear and inescapable teaching of Scripture. One is, the one we talked about before, that God wills or sincerely desires that every object of his love be redeemed. Two is, the Calvinist claim, that God will successfully redeem everyone he chooses to redeem. And the third is that some people will be lost forever and will be separated from God forever. And uh, the Calvinists reject the first claim that God wills, or so, wills that all be saved, like, uh, what is it, uh, Second Peter 3, 9, they say, well, he doesn't want any of the elect to be lost. Um, the Arminians reject the claim that God will be successful in saving everyone that he chooses to save. And the th Universalists reject the third claim that some people will be lost forever. And yet you can find people with respect to each of those claims each of those three propositions who argue that it is a clear and obvious teaching of Scripture. And that sort of uh, set me off, I guess, in the direction that I have come since.